The following is a local resident producer's program. The program content is the sole responsibility of the producer and does not necessarily reflect the views or policies of CATV2, Oshkosh Community Access Television, the City of Oshkosh, the Oshkosh Cable Television Advisory Commission, or Time Warner Cable. Hi everyone, welcome to another edition of Ayan Oshkosh. I'm Cheryl Hentz along with my co-host Tony Palmieri. On this edition we're very pleased and honored to be joined by uh, Congressman Mark Green. Uh, Congressman Green is from the 8th Congressional District up in the northern part of the state, Green Bay and uh, surrounding areas. Uh, Governor, um, he's running for governor. <laughs> I'm calling you governor already. already. <laughs> A little premature. Um, you are seeking the uh, gubernatorial position in 2006, running mm -hmm. against um, present Jim governor Jim Doyle. Uh, welcome to the show. We Thank know you. your schedule is uh, very, very busy. Both, Delighted uh, to be here. <laughs> both as a sitting congressman and, and trying to run a campaign. So yeah, And being a dad in between. There you yeah. go. And a husband. And so. a husband. So uh, we, we appreciate you taking time out to be here. And, uh, you know, during the next 55 minutes or so, we're going to get into very specific issues. But in a nutshell, uh, Congressman, can you just tell uh, viewers why you're seeking the, the top spot in the state of Wisconsin? I, I believe that over the next four or five years in Wisconsin, we're going to make choices. We're going to face challenges that will set the state's course for 20 or 30 years to come. And I'm genuinely worried about what's happening in this state. You know, we have an amazing state in so many ways, a remarkable heritage. I always remind people that when Jay Leno rides a motorcycle, it was a motorcycle built in Milwaukee. Mm. When Lance Armstrong won his Tour de France, it was on a bicycle built in Waterloo, Wisconsin. And when Ted no uh, Nugent bagged his trophy bucket, it was with a bow built in Bloomer, Wisconsin. With this amazing heritage in the entrepreneurial sector, in the area of social movements, we're the birthplace of the Republican Party, the birthplace of the Progressive Party, we're the birthplace of kindergarten down in Watertown. The great social movements of our time have been launched in this state. And yet too many people in the state are beginning to wonder. A and they're talking about whether or not we're slipping. And they're actually beginning to say, that maybe our best days are behind us. I think that's terrible. Mm -hmm. Man, I honestly believe with all of my heart that with the right leadership in the state, we can make Wisconsin great again. And, and obviously, I believe I can provide that leadership, and that's why I'm running for governor. Okay. Right. Um, you know, one of the things that you support is, is a property tax freeze. Um, you've said that if elected governor, uh, you would sign such a measure into law. You know, I, I certainly don't agree with um, all the ways in which our local officials spend money. Mm -hmm. But I don't agree with uh, the way the people in Madison spend money either. Why do you feel that it's better to take control out of the local government's hands when our own leaders in Madison have, what I think, done a pretty deplorable job of, mm -hmm. of managing our tax dollars? Well, uh, understand the property tax free simply buys us time in order to build something longer term that I think works with local leaders. It's not just about revenue control. I believe in revenue controls, but I believe we also have to give our local leaders the tools to manage flexibly. I mean, mandate relief. They need flexibility in governing. Mm -hmm. And they aren't seeing a lot of that out of Madison. I want to help provide that. So I believe that you, you have uh, taxing and spending limits, but you do that in order to buy us time. The reason we have to buy time, or the reason that we have to do this in the first place, we have the fifth worst state and local tax burden in the country. In the country. I mean, our, our property taxes are 27% above the national average. Right. We are losing people to other states. W we have graduates leaving this state. We don't see the economic growth that we should be seeing. A and I believe that part of the reason for that, at least part of the reason, is because of a rising tax burden. If you get taxes under control by freezing taxes, but that gives you the time to work with local leaders to build a long term solution. And that isn't a, a, a property tax freeze by itself. That's simply a step towards that solution. But Congressman, I, I've noticed, I've read some y your website. We'll have mm -hmm. the, uh, the address on the, uh, on the screen or people can look it up. You seem to avoid coming out and saying you're for the Taxpayer Bill of Rights. I haven't seen it yet. Are the, the, the Taxpayer Bill of Rights has not been introduced by Glenn Grothman in the State Senate yet. So uh, I, I can say what I have seen, and what I have seen, there's a lot to like in it. 
But uh, again, there is not even a bill that has been introduced. But you like the general setting. concept. Well, again, I, I think we do need to have some, first up, again, the first step is a, is a property tax freeze, yeah. and that simply buys you time to construct what is the longer term answer. I think some kind of long term spending uh, and revenue control, I think it does make sense. 27 states have it. Because you are heavily supported by, is it Americans for Tax Reform? They've, That's they've, the uh, Norquist they've given, organization. They've given me their award every year I've been in Congress. And they are one of the founders of the Taxpayer Bill of Rights types of bills. Sure, yeah. so, if, so if we have a Governor Green, you're probably going to advocate strongly for a Taxpayer Bill of Rights. In some form, yeah. And I'm not only that, but I'm going to work with lo local leaders to, to construct the right version of it. Absolutely. But local leaders, haven't they? Haven't local leaders been the ones most heavily against a Taxpayer Bill of well, Rights? Well, again, there's not even a bill introduced into the Senate yet. So we're talking about something yet that doesn't quite exist. but. Um, you know, most of the local leaders that I know mm -hmm. are frugal to begin with, and again, they're looking for help from Madison, helping them to provide tax relief, and they get tax relief by providing mandate relief and working with them, and I think that needs to be part of the solution. I think we'll put something together that will have the support of local leaders. You said in your announcement, Congressman, you said, I'll make this pledge to all of you. Elect me as your governor, and Wisconsin's tax burden will improve, or I won't run for re-election. That's pretty bold, isn't it? I think it has to be. But again, when you have the fifth worst state and local tax burden in the country, the tenth worst business tax climate in the country, when, when Forbes magazine, Money magazine, and Bloomberg News rate you as the single worst state to retire to, bar none, when you are 38th in the nation in terms of the percentage of the population that have four-year college degrees because so many people are leaving, you have to be bold. If we, don't, if we are not bold, right. we're going to lose families, we're going to lose jobs, we're going to lose businesses, and that would be a catastrophe for this state. So, but wouldn't you end up basically going, I, one of the reasons why Wisconsin has those, those ratings mm -hmm. on taxation is because traditionally we've avoided fees. Mm -hmm. So wouldn't you end up just moving everything over into a fee-based system? Not necessarily. Um, you're, you're right in that we're, we're up there in the top 10 or 15 in almost every tax that you can mm -hmm. name as you go along. But, but part of it is making uh, government run more efficiently by working to make government more effective. And it is also by uh, growing this economy. You grow this economy, you have the tax revenues coming in to help you meet many mm -hmm. of the challenges that we have. Now, obviously, like most states, we've just been going through a recession, and hopefully the economy is beginning to turn the corner. I mean, it, it, I don't think any of us have seen enough yet to say we're right, you know, in, right. in full recovery. Hopefully it's moving in the right direction. But our problem in this state is we continue to increase spending by double digit. Right. We have spending going up by two or three times mm -hmm. the rate of inflation. Right. We have property taxes going up. In the last two years, property taxes have gone up nearly 11 percent. That's the highest increase in nearly a decade. And uh, as I travel around the state, people are telling me they can't afford it anymore. Right. Mm -hmm. Cheryl, Cheryl, one more question on taxes. Sure, go ahead. Uh, Jim Doyle signed, and the legislature, or the legislature passed, and Doyle signed the single sales factor mm -hmm. for corporate taxation, big business taxation. And I'm interested. You're you're a big fan of Tommy Thompson. Tommy Thompson would not sign off on single sales factor because it didn't include something called combined reporting. Do you support the single sales factor that Doyle signed off on? Um, I would have supported it, yeah. I mean, I, I can't tell you I've spent a lot of time looking at it because it's already the law. But uh, I do believe that we need to take steps to keep our economy state economy competitive and attractive for businesses to do business in this state. And that certainly was a step in the right direction. Even if it means taking $40, 50000000 million a year out of the budget? Well, but, but, but again, the businesses leave and you've taken that much money out of the budget. I mean, you, you lose those taxpayers and it's a moot point. You lose that revenue coming in. A growing economy is part of the answer to our state's economic ills. And uh, keeping our state competitive, I think, is an important part of that. Sure. Well, still on, on the subject of taxes, um, you know, I had your comment down here, too, that, that you had uh, mentioned in, in your announcement speech. Improving our tax burden, that can be taken a lot of different ways sure. by a lot of different people. What exactly does well, that and, mean to Mark Green? And, well, for me, it, it means lifting the burden on working families. Um, again, when property taxes are 27 percent above the national average, that is a burden that falls hardest on working families. Mm -hmm. So that, to me, is the measure. I mean, that's what we've got to focus on. Okay. Property tax relief, you know, property taxes come in a lot of different ways. My property taxes, for example, are going to go up automatically at the end of this year by $553 because of the reassessments that we recently mm -hmm. had. Um, 
then factor into that road repairs that are being done on my street um, mm -hmm. and whatever the city, county, and, and local Numerous school district do. Put into it um, you know, how, I mean, you only have, as a governor, would have so much control over that. So how how can anyone, not just Mark mm -hmm. Green, but how can anyone say, we're going to give you property tax relief when there's all these other entities but, involved? But remember, this is not the first time we have given tax relief. In 1995, when we did the two-thirds funding, which and I was in the legislature at the time, we did provide property tax mm -hmm. relief, objectively. It can be done. It isn't going to be easy. It's going to require all of us to sit down and prioritize. It's going to require us to make you know, common sense choices. And it's going to require us to grow the economy. And I think we can do all those things. Okay. But, Congressman, when you voted for that two-third funding mm -hmm. of the public schools in 94, 95, 95, when it, yeah. 95, isn't that the reason for our structural deficit now? No. We, the, it's I mean, certainly a contributing factor. Yeah, but, but again, it, spending is increasing by two or three times the rate of inflation. Well, my, you know Mike Ellis very well, I know, mm -hmm. right? And uh, Mike Ellis, the Republican senator, from Nina, so he calls Tommy Thompson the godfather of the structural deficit. Of course, Mike was in the legislature yes. and voted for it at the time with us. But uh, again, I keep bringing up this Tommy Thompson analogy because mm -hmm. I think everyone agrees that Tommy was a great cheerleader for the mm -hmm. state. And I think you would be a good cheerleader for the state. But Tommy was a big spending Republican. How, ca how can you, uh, how can remember, you show people Remember you what make? Tommy Thompson faced when he came into office. An economy that was truly in free fall. We had double-digit unemployment, double-digit inflation. We had interest rates, and that's driven more in the national scene than on the, the state scene, by well into the double digits. We had companies l leaving Wisconsin. We all remember when Kimberly Clark left. Mm -hmm. We had signs at the border. Remember those, those you know, kind of humorous signs from Illinois saying, when the last business leaving Wisconsin, please turn off the lights? That's what Tommy was faced with, a terrible economy. And Tommy came in and uh, got the economy revved up and, and did more to create jobs and put us on the right track than uh, any governor, and certainly in, in, in my lifetime. Do I agree with everything that Tommy did? Of no, course not. But we have the structural deficit, which mm -hmm. I know, right? And, and the legislature in the last several budget cycles has been getting a balanced budget through accounting tricks. You agree with that, I'm sure. Well, and Jim what? Doyle has submitted a budget that's full yes, of holes in accounting and I, tricks. and I agree with that. What would Mark Green do to solve the structural deficit problem? <laughs> You sit down with the people of this state and you say, look, we've got a problem on our hands. We're all to blame. You're to blame, I'm to blame. Why are we to blame? Because we spent more money than we have coming in. And what we need to do is get ourselves back on track. And we do that through honest budgeting, not fund raids, which is what we've seen, not accounting tricks where we shift things down the line. We just went through a, a budget in which the governor raided to the tune of several hundred million dollars the transportation fund. Sure replaced it with bonds, which makes every road project in the state more expensive, and it locks us into higher tax rates because the taxpayers will have to pay more and more just to pay off the interest well, rates sure. on those bonds. Well, yeah. But all of that, those are accounting tricks, you're yeah. right, but you sit down with the yes. people of the state yeah. and you say, this is what we yeah. got And do. it's unconscionable. Mm -hmm. But you're sitting here saying, you're not going to raise any taxes. Okay. Sounds like you'd like to cut taxes. I'd love to cut taxes. So how, sure. how will you make the state run? Where, where's the money coming from? What would well, you cut? But, but again, first off, remember, if you've got spending going up by nearly 10 percent, double, you know, two and three times the rate of inflation, the first mm -hmm. thing you do is don't increase it by two or three rate, times the rate of inflation. That in and of itself gives you some of the money you need right there, right there. If, if nothing else is done, you do it right there. Where would you make major cuts? Do you see, do you see fat oh, in that budget? Where's, oh, where's I, the I, budget? Oh, I think, first off, um, we wouldn't be in the situation that we're in because I'd work with the legislature to try to produce a budget that makes sense. What we've seen right now, the tone in Madison is about the worst I've ever seen. Yeah, it's bad. And so you've got, um, you know, eat, it's a food fight. <laughs> and you've got both sides, the sides being the legislature and the governor, throwing food at each other, and nobody's sitting down and producing the kind of budget that um, I think we all want to be proud of. Mm -hmm. But we've got a budget from, from this governor with his, veto, with his vetoes that has done, uh, to put it politely, some legally interesting things in this budget. Mm -hmm. He's uh, appropriated money, or spending money that was never appropriated by the legislature, perhaps spending money that was never authorized by the legislature, and even using his veto power, I think this is unprecedented, maybe I'm wrong, to use vetoes to increase spending, not cut spending. That's a disaster. What we need is a legislature and a governor who sit down together and work to produce a budget that we can all be proud of. We can do that. There are also, I, I think, ways of um, 
uh, well, you know, the, I know other topics coming along, but I think we need to sit down and look for better efficiencies in government. I know every governor says that, but I believe we can take a look at that. You take a look at, for example, the cost overruns, mm -hmm. millions of dollars in the construction of the voter database that they've put together. Right. You look at the fact that the governor contracted out for a website for the market interchange, which according to the state employees who were interviewed, was two or three times more expensive than they would have done if they had done it in-house. This governor has taken a number of steps where he's contracted out so he can say that he's eliminated the state jobs only to discover that the contracted cost out services mm -hmm. yep. cost more money than, <laughs> I mean, so there are, there are numerous examples of where you can find but he is money. A but he is a Democrat and we have a Republican legislature. We call that divided government, as you sure. know. Assuming the Republicans keep control of the legislature, we don't know that they will, but let's assume that right. they do. You're a Republican. Why shouldn't people be afraid of a Republican, le a Republican legislature and a governor when there not be enough clash? I mean, you're right, there's an ugly mood on there right now. Well, but it, isn't it's it just about as bad to have, uh, have all the levels of government in agreement on everything? Well, I, I doubt that we would. You know, I doubt that we'd be in agreement on everything. But <laughs> it's a matter of providing leadership. I mean, I, I, I think you want a governor who gets involved in the process. In talking about the budget now, getting involved early in the budget. Obviously, he unveils the budget, and that's the first step in it. Sure. But works with the legislature every every step along the way. Remember what's just happened in this budget. We've had we have some really difficult challenges in the area of medical assistance. I mean, these, these are mm -hmm. tough. And these are some of the most important programs for the vulnerable amongst us. The Joint Finance Committee, Republicans and Democrats, worked to craft a pretty good answer on medical assistance. Passed 16 to nothing, unanimously. The governor then broke his word after saying that he would work with them and vetoed out the whole thing, took that medical assistance money out, raided that fund and sent the money elsewhere. I mean, that's the last thing you need in terms of building the kind of trust you should have to meet our state's fiscal challenges. Um, I'll provide leadership. I won't be a yes man to anybody in the state legislature. If I wanted to do that, I'd stay where I'm at. I'd, I'd run for the state assembly. I believe you need a governor who provides strong, consistent leadership, will get involved in the process every step of the way, and help set the priorities. And obviously, we haven't seen that. Sure. You spoke about uh, medical assistance. Let's talk about health care as a whole. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> as you know, people across this country are surviving somehow without health insurance or with poor health right. insurance. Many right here in Wisconsin. One of the problems we have in this state is that a lot of people, um, you know, if they don't qualify for badger care uh, because they don't have children, uh, they, I and they can't afford private health care, they're falling through the cracks. Yeah. Um, you know, I and, and then uh, the uh, Wisconsin Health Insurance Risk. HERSP. HERSP, yes. yes. <laughs> the risk plan that uh, I have recently found out, um, besides the premiums that continue to go up on that alone, I have recently learned that people on that plan, um, when they have medical costs that they're submitting to the insurance company, which I guess in this case is the state right. in, in a roundabout sort of way, sure. um, the state or HERSP is only applying the portion that Medicare would cover against that person's deductible. So if you have a $200 bill, for example, uh, and Medicare would only pay maybe $50, that's all the credit that these people are getting toward their deductible. Now that hardly seems fair. Mm -hmm. And that's just one example of inequities within the health care system. What would a Governor Green do to help everybody in this state have health care? A number of steps we need to take. Uh, first off, what's interesting, um, and, and HERSP is a program in need of reform, another interesting example. On a bipartisan basis, they brought forward uh, reforms on HERSP that the health care community around the state helped construct and supported, and then the governor vetoed it hmm. after reaching a consensus. Another example, I think, of, of poor leadership. There is no single answer to our health care challenges. There are lots of pieces. Um, I support the concept of association health plans on the federal level, which would allow uh, individuals to band together. For example, some of the highest insurance rates that you'll find in the state are for farmers, small mm -hmm. family farmers. They, mm -hmm. they have no leverage or purchasing power. Right. So they're able to get together through an association like the Farm Bureau. They can pool and create some of the same leverage that uh, uh, employees would have at you know, a, a GM or, or, or a large employer. That's an important step. 
I believe in uh, health savings accounts as a step in the right direction. This is the only governor, Republican or Democrat, in the United States to veto the tax deductibility of health savings accounts. Mm -hmm. Health savings accounts combined with refundable tax credits that would help those of lower income purchase the catastrophic portion that you need to activate a health savings account, I think that's a step in the right direction. Uh, so I think there, there are lots of things that we need to do. Um, in the area of medical assistance, there are governors all around this country, Republican and Democrat. Governor Warner in Virginia is an example of a Democrat. Uh, Governor Jeb Bush in Florida, an example of a Republican, are working to help reform medical assistance so that the dollars go further and reach more people. We haven't seen anything mm -hmm. from this administration, mm -hmm. sadly. Uh, and it's obviously, it's complicated. It's a mm -hmm. difficult, difficult challenge. Health care is awfully important to me. My father has been a physician for over 50 years, still practices up in the Green Bay area. Most of his patients are senior, and many of his, his uh, you know, patients are thereby on a fixed income and face challenges. And so, you know, we do talk about this, and this is awfully important. Medical assistance, again, is a, is a program that helps uh, address at least some of the health care needs of the most vulnerable amongst us. And, and uh, it, it looked as though we were moving in the right direction. And again, uh, you know, unfortunately, the governor seemed to pull the rug out. Would you work as governor to see that everybody in this state has some kind of health care coverage? I, I think that that's something that we should strive for. Again, there is no single simple answer mm -hmm. to this. But um, I secured the federal <laughs> money to help afford the administrative costs for Wisconsin's innovative health care cooperative that is being done through the Wisconsin Federation of Co-ops. And that's a way for, uh, again, uh, small business persons and farmers, those in rural areas in particular, to use the co-op model to be able to purchase health care. Again, it's not the answer, mm -hmm. but it is a step towards it. So, uh, you know, I, I think we have to be prepared each and every day to work on health care. Right. And I doubt, I, I just don't believe that there's going to be a time when we pass a bill where we sort of say, you know, whew, taking care of the health care right. problem. I believe it's something that we're going to have to work on as far out in the future mm -hmm. as I can see. Well, and uh, I'm going to toss it back to Tony here in a second, but on the subject of health care still, uh, you know, Governor Doyle a few months ago was very proud when he announced some kind of a, a prescription program. I, I'm sorry, I'm at a loss for exactly what the name of that program was, mm -hmm. but, you know, he basically encouraged everybody to, to take part in this prescription program, um, getting prescriptions at, uh, at, at a reduced type rate and, and saving some money there. But if you can't even afford basic health care, mm -hmm. uh, to go to a doctor to find out what's wrong with you, uh, I don't see how you're going to get a prescription. Um, I, I personally think one of the ways that we need, one of the things we need to work on is seeing that everybody is eligible for some kind of um, coverage under the um, Badger Care in, mm -hmm. in one form or another. And I guess that's one of the things that, um, you know, viewers too would like sure. to, to see a governor do. Go ahead, Tony. Well, Congressman, you say you are a friend of the working people, and your district represents lots of blue-collar folks. Sure. Yet you recently voted for the Central American Free Trade Agreement, mm -hmm. CAFTA, passed by a 217-215 vote, so right. you could have been the deciding vote. The AFL-CIO in Wisconsin has bashed you for that mm -hmm. vote. Sarah Rogers says that Mark Green chose party loyalty and corporate bucks over the people of Wisconsin. How do you respond to that? Why was CAFTA a good vote for Wisconsin? It's a no-brainer for Wisconsin. She's absolutely wrong. First off, if a number of Democrats hadn't voted for it, it would have failed. A number of Democrats 15. crossed over. Yeah, well, but that's a number of Democrats. Fifteen Democrats crossed over. Twenty-seven Republicans voted no. Under intense pressure and threats from a number of the labor unions. I take a case-by-case -case basis in trade agreements. I voted against many of them. I voted against Singapore. I voted against Australia. And I voted for others. The simple standard is whether or not it is good for the state of Wisconsin. Why is CAFTA good for Wisconsin? It's a no-brainer. 80% of the, under the current law, before CAFTA goes into effect, 80% of the goods mm -hmm. from those nations come into this country tariff-free. 80% of the goods that we send to those countries go in under tariffs. But the so we're lifting those okay. tariffs simply gives opportunities okay. for our farmers to send products into those countries that they do not have duty-free under But the AFL-CIO came out with a report that said between January 2001 and May 2004, 61% of the layoffs by Wisconsin manufacturers were trade-related. Not to CAFTA. Caf you asked me about CAFTA. Well, but, no, but, but CAFTA is a separate issue. CAFTA is a separate... It's an extension of NAFTA. They're talking about it's NAFTA It's not layoffs. true. 
They're, diff they're different. They have different terms. Kind of you know better than that. Take a look at the terms of CAFTA. CAFTA is fairly simple. 80% mm -hmm. of the goods that go into those countries from the United States are farm products, which is why the Farm Bureau endorsed this legislation, go in with duties and tariffs. 80% of the goods that come from those countries already come into this country duty-free under a uh, decades-old trade agreement that had nothing to do with either this Congress or this President. Previous presidents and Congresses set up a trade structure with these countries, which was a really bad deal. All this did was create a fair, uh, a, a level playing field, create fair trade, because it removed the tariffs and our goods going into those countries. Why did 27 Republicans vote against it? Because they disagreed. But, and so you th you're on record as saying this will be good for Wisconsin. CAFTA will be good for Wisconsin. Not just me. It's the Wisconsin Farm Bureau. It is numerous organizations that wrote to us. Um, I mean, I'm not the only one. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah, it will be. It's an, this, is, this is a net win for Wisconsin agriculture, which is why Wisconsin agriculture supported it. And this deals with economics. And mm -hmm. let's talk a little bit about economic uh, policy. The governor, Doyle, um, advocated strongly for increase in minimum wage. Mm -hmm. And the Republican legislature fought him on that every step of the way. Where were you on minimum wage? Were well, you against it? Again, first off, there, there were different issues here. One of the issues that I thought was awfully important w was not to set um, a community by community minimum wage standard, which is one of the things that was occurring in the state legislature. I think that's terrible economic policy. Uh, the minimum wage is largely irrelevant in northeastern Wisconsin. There are almost nobody that's getting paid minimum wage. Well, when I talk to employers, very few people are getting the minimum wage. What I am more concerned about, the real issue, and this, is, this became a political sideshow, no one wanted to talk about it. The issue isn't about increasing the minimum wage. Do I think the minimum wage is a wage you can raise a family on? No. Do I think if you increase the minimum wage by a dollar, it's a wage you can raise a family on? No. The question is, how do we create good paying jobs, the jobs that you can raise a family on? That's the issue here, and the minimum wage was a sideshow. Well, I mean, you're right. There aren't a lot of people making the minimum wage, but there are a lot of people making seven, eight, nine dollars an hour. And we it's, need to it's hard to raise a family on mm -hmm. seven, eight, nine dollars an hour. Absolutely, and we need to do a better job. All right, what's the, what is the Mark Green strategy to get jobs into into the, the states sure. that are paying the old kind of union wages with great benefits? You you claim CAFTA and things like that are going to help out with that. Mm -hmm. Well, so not just not just me. Again, the Wisconsin yeah. Farm Bureau. And a number of organizations do. But so what's 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 the Mark Green strategy for the economy? Number of steps, uh, and you can see that in the work that I have done. Uh, number one, we need to lower the barriers to companies growing, which means we need to do a better job in lowering um, the taxes that hold them back. I think we need to now. I think we need to take a look at the liability issues, which I believe are going to be job killers after the state supreme court struck down. Mm -hmm. Um, not only the medical liability laws, but also created this unusual theory of liability under lead paint. I think address liability. I think we need to invest in education. Seventy-five percent of the jobs that are going to be created in this country in the years ahead will require a post-high school education of some kind. Mm -hmm. I would invest heavily in the DW system. Um, I also would invest in research. Up in northeastern Wisconsin, I secure the startup money for a paper science research center, which we hope will create world-class research for the forestry and paper industry, which will create the kind of will keep Wisconsin's paper industry, 50 percent of the manufacturing jobs in the state, one way or another, related to paper and forestry, keep it on the cutting edge, keep it world-class. That's how you create jobs. I want to make sure state. I heard you right, Congressman. You said invest heavily in the UW system. Mm -hmm. The Republicans voted for the $250 million cut which, in the last which, biennium. Which Jim Doyle proposed. Right, but they, they went yeah, along but, with but it. But Jim Doyle, as a leader, cut drastic sums from the UW system. Sure. So let's, let's make sure we understand who led that charge. Right, but, but the Republican legislature mm -hmm. went with it. What, are you saying you would restore that $250 million? Uh, what I'm saying is um, I would not have made that cut, as the governor did, and I especially would not have balanced that cut on the back of students. They jacked up tuition by nearly 37% in two years. I think it's wrong. Do you support a tuition freeze? Um, I've supported the concept of a tuition freeze, but I think it's more than that. I think we need to take a look at tuition. I think we need to, right before Catherine Lyle left, mm -hmm. she told me that the, the, the family income of the average student starting at DW-Madison is now over $90,000. We are losing access to the gem that we have in the UW system. Right. The uh, Board of Regents, the Governor's Board of Regents, 
keeps jacking up tuition each year. They have made, uh, they being the governor's office, has now made several cuts to the EW system. I think we need to take a look at accessibility. I think we need to do a better job on how we run the EW system. I think that there are examples of bureaucracy there that uh, scare me. I think the public, if we're not careful, will lose its faith in the EW system. Uh, my wife and I both graduated from UW Eau Claire. I love my time there. I mean, I, I wouldn't trade that education for anything. Mm -hmm. Uh, a lot of families are worried about whether their kids are going to have a crack at that same Absolutely. educational opportunity that they do. I believe in the EW system. I want to help rescue and restore the EW system, which means taking a look at accessibility and finding ways to hold down the tuition increases, because I think those tuition increases are now beginning to seriously threaten accessibility. I think we need to take a look at how we administer the EW system, because I think too much of the money, you know, and, and admittedly some of this is anecdotal. We see the anecdotes. But I think too much of the money isn't getting to where it needs to go. I think it's getting eaten up in bureaucracy. Yeah, right. I think those are all very important parts of it. All right, well, this is a university to town, as you know. If, uh, can you sit here today and pledge that if you get into office in January of 2007 in your first budget, you will not propose any further cuts to the UW? Well, first of all, that gets proposed, as you know, by the Board of Regents. But what I can say is I will be a UW-friendly governor, that I will not do what this governor's done, which is jack up tuition by over 50% in four years, and um, do nothing, I think, to reinforce sound practices and good administration in the UW system. Uh, I consider my friend of the, uh, a friend of the UW. I've been a member of the founders at UW Green Bay. Um, I have worked closely with chancellors from around the state. I have visited most of the campuses in the state. I've taken a look at the innovative research you're doing down at Platteville, the par Pioneer Farm. Mm -hmm. I'm a huge believer in the UW system. I think the UW system by this governor has been taken for granted. And I think worse than that, with these increases, I think, again, we're losing accessibility to what is, if not our greatest advantage as a state economically, one of our greatest advantages. What about, can we talk about K through 12 for a second? What uh, what sure. What about K through 12 education? The governor um, ended up, through his vetoes, giving mm -hmm. much more money through the, to the K through 12 system than the Republican legislature want, wanted to. What, what, is, what is Mark Green's vision of K through 12? Well, the financing um, of it. Uh, a couple of parts. First off, remember that Republicans offered a record increase. They offered every dollar that was requested by uh, DPI. The governor did much more. Yeah. You know, the governor has said that education is his highest priority. That's good. And if that statement were, were true by itself, I think that's a great statement to make. Unfortunately for this governor, education, K-12, through seems to be his only priority. He was willing to borrow money from the future. He was willing to raid money from other accounts. And I think that was wrong. I mean, Are you I suggesting that he's in control of the teachers union? I don't think I said that, but no, I think didn't. the I teachers union is in control that. of him. They are. Yeah, I think so. But it won't it won't his uh, financing. I don't think you get a lot of people dispute dispute you, that contention. You say, you, well, he would dispute it. You you say you support property tax relief. Mm -hmm. Won't his funding for K through twelve reduce property taxes? No. They've already gone up 11% in the last two years. He's th we're hearing that we're going to have no property tax increase as a result of his, no, his funding. Funny, then a, then the, a $5 cut next the, year. The day after he said that, the Democratic Party of Wisconsin, under my friend Joe Winicky, said a, sent a statement out saying, well, of course, we shouldn't take that literally. But again, they've already gone up 11% in the last two years. Do you support years. maintaining this, the state's two-thirds commitment? Um, this governor broke the two-thirds commitment, as you know. I mean, this was the governor that broke the two-thirds commitment. I was in the legislature that helped create the two-thirds commitment. I think that's something that uh, I is, a, f is a, a fine goal. Again, I supported help to create it. But I guess the question is, uh, I think what's happening is so much damage is being done, so much is being put onto the credit card, so many projects are being delayed, raising their mm -hmm. costs. We have a $1.2 billion deficit announced the day the governor signed the budget. What will it be when they get actually close to putting the next bud budget together? The governor has dug a, such a deep hole that, you know, while he's putting money into K through 12 to help educate mm -hmm. students, he's also ensuring that when they graduate, they're going to have huge debts to pay and a huge credit card bill to take care of. That's the wrong approach. Education should be our highest priority. It isn't our only priority. We have to work on health care, especially mm -hmm. for those who are among the most vulnerable. This governor took money out of medical assistance, among the most vulnerable that we have, and, and you know, shoved it to get to his record increase on... Uh, on K through 12. Education should be a very high priority, but we have to do it in a sound way. We shouldn't straddle our kids with great debts, and uh, I think we shouldn't engage in the fundraising that we've seen. Okay, Kay. Cheryl. Um, one of our viewers sent in a, a question, and um, she would like to know 
how you can claim to support American troops while voting against increasing VA funding for health care, against additional job assistance funding for veterans, and you voted against extending TRICARE to National Guard and Reservists. It's not true. Tell us the truth. What is the truth? I, I, it's not true. I voted okay. against this veterans budget. I mean, I voted against th the president's budget because I believe it didn't do enough on the veterans mm -hmm. case. I didn't vote for that budget. I voted against it. Okay. So, so you um, did not vote against increasing VA funding for health care? I'm not sure what she's referring to. Okay. I voted against this last budget. And I'm not, and I'm not sure either. This mm. just came to us by the email. Only, so again, let's, let's talk about state issues. Mm -hmm. This governor in his budget proposed rating $25 million from the Veterans Trust Fund. That is the state veterans Trust. That's the state veterans issue mm -hmm. that we have. I think that was a mistake. Fortunately, it's not in the final version of the budget. I mean, that's, that's a, a key state veterans issue. Okay. All right. Let's talk about our environment, uh, con Congressman. The Republicans in this last session tried to eliminate the Smart Growth Program, mm -hmm. and Doyle put it back. Mm -hmm. Where do you stand on the Smart Growth Program? I think planning is a really good thing, I and I think um, that we need to do everything we can to encourage planning. Smart Growth was designed to be a consensus program around the state. Clearly, that consensus has been broken. There are parts of the state that are bitterly opposed to smart growth. What I think we need to do is go back to the drawing board and create a program that supports planning, encourages through financial incentives, planning to take place all around the state. The planning needs to take place in, in a rapidly growing suburban area like Waukesha are obviously not the same as they may occur in you know, a, a rural district. But I think it is appropriate for the state to follow through and provide uh, significant financial incentives to encourage planning. The largest complaint that I hear from communities around the state, and it's obviously this has all occurred fairly recently, mm -hmm. is that the legislature and the governor have failed to follow through in providing the financial assistance that these communities need. If we're going to have good planning, which I think we should, if we're going to help communities plan that want to plan, we need to create, we need to back it up with money. Yeah. And obviously that, that hasn't happened. Right. What about uh, restoring the public intervener? Now, Governor Thompson mm -hmm. got rid of that position mm -hmm. in a budget. Sure. Do you support the public intervener position? Uh, no. Why not? Because the public intervener position is using taxpayer dollars to sue taxpayers. That hardly seems to be a wise use of, of taxpayer dollars. If the public intervener had been successful, for example, in Brown County, mm -hmm. this is back in the 90s, they would have blocked dredging in the Brown County Harbor which would have stopped those barges coming in to provide supplies for our paper companies and would put, put people out of work using taxpayer dollars to do it. Well, you ta you've mistake. talked about Governor Doyle and his, the funding he gets from the, t the teachers union, but you've gotten mm. lots of money for your congressional races from the paper industry. The largest employers in Wisconsin, yeah. Well, how can you assure people that you're uh, independent in how you deal with issues that affect have been in my record. Haven't you voted, or, or wouldn't you support every tax break that they'd want? <laughs> That's a great loaded question. No, I take a look at every single proposal that comes for me and judge it on its own basis. Uh, Governor Doyle's gotten money from paper companies. Governor Doyle's gotten pa uh, money from a variety of sources, as have I. That means that they share my agenda, not necessarily I share theirs. Well, but it does, it does lead, though, doesn't it, to the issue of reform of, say, campaign financing? Mm -hmm. What, what, is your, what is your position on, on political reform? I mean, not, not just campaign financing. I read this morning that lobbying groups spent a record $16.2 million in the first half of the year trying to influence our legislature and, as our, governor. and our governor as they crafted the two-year state budget. There's something wrong with that, isn't there? Tell you know why you know that? Because of a law that I wrote. I wrote the most significant lobbying reform in the state's modern history. I wrote the lobbying online law. A law that allows you to get information online about how uh, the process is working, about where a bill is in the process, about who is lobbying on it, whether it be a business interest, whether it be a labor interest. I help provide the tools for you and for observers and organizations to be able to evaluate the process. That's how committed I am to lobbying reform. But it's not enough just to reform. know that it's going on. But then, yeah. that's yeah. I'm committed to lobbying reform. Um, we need to do... Uh, first of all, I would support the consolidation of the Ethics Board and Elections Board and create mm -hmm. a stronger body. I think that makes sense that Senator Ellis has put forward. But we also need to do things right. Um, my friend Senator Feingold, uh, obviously McCain-Feingold, name for right. the work that he did, uh, I think the intentions were great. 
I think it has failed miserably to keep money out of politics. We have seen more money spent in this last couple of campaign cycles than sure. ever before. Um, I think a first step towards good campaign finance reform in this state would be to strengthen the ethics board and the elect to consolidate and then strengthen the ethics board and the election. I think that's a step in the right mm -hmm. direction. And um, beyond that, I'm open to to proposals on uh, campaign. But finance you don't reform. you don't uh, necessarily you don't support the Ellis campaign finance reform bill. You know, to be honest, I haven't studied it in depth. Okay, Cheryl. Um, Earlier, um, we talked about uh, creating good paying jobs and so forth. And under Governor Doyle, we now have something called the Jobs Creations Act, um, mm -hmm. which, you know, mm -hmm. was intended, we were told, to eliminate a lot of the bureaucracy, the paperwork, and all the legal red sure. tape that companies have to go through when they're trying to get permits to start up operations or expand operations and so forth. Um, Opponents and uh, critics of, of that act have said it's, it's raping our environment. Where does Congressman Green, potential Governor Mark Green, stand on the Jobs Creations Act? Uh, we need a Job Creation Act, too. We still have a process that um, I is complicated and bureaucratic. Now, let me make something clear. It's not about our environmental standards. We should maintain and enhance our environmental standards. It is the process that it takes to get there. Uh, I had, uh, in fact, I had a, a, a paper company. This is a couple of years ago come to see me. And uh, they had closed down one of their operations, one of their lines in northeastern Wisconsin and opened a line down, I think it was Georgia. It was a southern state in sure. any case. And I asked them why. And they said, it's not the environmental standards. We'll meet any environmental standards you set. They said the process took so long for us to even get an answer or on our permit that by the time we get that answer, we can already have the machine running in the southern United States. Mm -hmm. Same standards, but the process itself took far too long. I think you know, if, if a permit isn't granted because a company, an applicant, fails to meet the standard, then that's but too bad. Congressman, every but the process itself should not be the reason. But Congressman, every environmental organization in the state came out against these job creation acts. Mm -hmm. Every the late Gaylord Nelson came out against it. They claim it undermines 30 years of environmental protections we've built up. How can you say it doesn't affect the environment? Well, I didn't say that. You just said that. But you said it's a process issue, not an environmental issue. No, I said that 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 if a company fails to meet an environmental standard, then too bad, then they shouldn't get the permit. But where they don't get the permit merely because of time, not because of failing to meet the standard, that becomes a problem. Right. What can we do to hasten that process then, Congressman? How, how do we speed up the permitting process while still you know, protecting our environment? Well, I, I think we, we try to make sure that we don't have duplicative review processes. We should try to make sure that they work at the same time and mm -hmm. that we get rigorous review but not uh, multiple repetitive duplicative review. That's one part of it. Secondly, I think we need someone um, within state government who will work with any applicant and help walk their, applica their application through the process. I think that makes sense. I think the utilization of technology makes sense. I think we need to take um, state government, Department of Commerce, DNR, whatever the agency is that's in, in charge of that particular permit, and disperse that and get that out closer to where businesses actually are. Mm -hmm. I think that makes sense. Get, get, get state government as much as you can out of the centralized control of Madison. I think all of those things are very, very helpful. Okay. Isn't part of the answer to stop cutting staff at the DNR? I mean, the DNR are the people that process these permits and we need they keep getting cut. Well, we need, uh, I'm not going to disagree with you. I mean, I, we need to make sure, if we're going to move this process along, that we not only have a streamlined process, but we have the experts in place to help review it. Um, I'm not one of those, and you bring up an interesting subject. I don't, don't share Governor Doyle's body count politics. When Governor Doyle got out there a couple of years ago and said, I'm going to cut 10,000 state employees, yeah. I mean, that's not how you govern. The job of a governor is to help deliver services to the people in the state in the most effective way he can or she can. In most cases, it's going to be a state employee or state agency providing that service. Mm -hmm. There will be some, some cases where it isn't. But it should always be on the basis of effectiveness of delivery of services, not to meet some sort of political number that's set out there. That's a disservice to the state employees who work in this state. Right. I mean, we have some great state employees. 
and, and many of these state employees want nothing more than to do their job, the opportunity to do their job mm -hmm. well. And when they see someone set out a number saying basically, I don't care if you're doing a good job, I'm going to eliminate your job because I need it to tally up to whatever my number is, I think it's a terrible mm -hmm. way to run things. Uh, an another way in which a lot of local leaders think is a terrible way to run things is unfunded mandates. Mm -hmm. uh, we hear about mandates coming out of Madison and even from the federal government day in and day out, mm -hmm. and yet there's no funding in place to accompany those mandates. What would a governor, Mark Green, do uh, to take some of that burden off of local communities? Well, I think what you do is you reach out, travel around to local communities, and ask them for a list. So, w you know, what is it that, that, what are the mandates out there? What are the restrictions out there that are hurting you in your ability to do your job well, you know, being delivering services and, and providing the services that a, a local unit you know, of government does? I mean, the vast majority of local government leaders in this state are frugal people. They're <laughs> entrepreneurial. Again, their intentions are great. They're trying to do the best job they can with limited resources. Mm -hmm. We should be partnering with them. And I think we can do that. Okay. Let's talk about gay marriage. Uh, some people want to see a constitutional amendment mm -hmm. that would say only a marriage between one man and one woman shall be valid or recognized as a marriage in the state. Um, do you support that amendment? I, I support, um, if, if, if that is the wording that I've seen, it, yeah. I believe that marriage should be legally recognized as being between one man and one woman, and I would put that in the Constitution. Well, what would you say to the argument that the way the language of this amendment reads, it would make domestic partner benefits impossible? Well, again, I haven't had a chance to, to see that, because obviously we're working on one on the federal level. Uh, we're you support it there, different. too. Yes. yes. Yeah. yeah, I do support that. I, I believe that, that family is the central unit of a healthy society. I believe that marriage is uh, an awfully important building block in society, so I believe it does m make sense to hold it up and, and provide it with that special legal do status. You not, do you not support the concept of civil unions, like what they have in uh, Vermont? The way that Vermont would do it? No. You don't? Why not? Again, I, again, it's a matter of semantics, but my belief is that, that legal marriage, which is, mm -hmm. is, a, is a marriage or relationship that has all the protections and, and legal status of a marriage as it exists now, I believe that should be restricted to a, a union between one man and one woman. You Look, talked about family. Yeah. Um, you know, family is a relative term. Families mm -hmm. can be any number of things. Mm -hmm. You can have extended families in any shape, form, Absolutely. or fashion. Absolutely. Um, many, many gay couples view themselves as family. Mm -hmm. um, well, this isn't, s what, what this is saying is that we hold up uh, as an important part of society, mm -hmm. an important building block, marriage is being between one man and one woman, and there's a special s status. We do believe it is important to foster that and hold that up. Would, would you support a domestic partnership act in which domestic partners um, who, you know, I, I'm not saying someone who has just moved in together right. for a week or something like that, but someone where they, where they share bills together, they, they have joint accounts together, that mm -hmm. kind of thing. Whether they're straight couples or gay mm -hmm. couples, would you support a domestic partnership act where they can have some of the financial benefits that marriage couple, uh, married couples have, well, where they can make health decisions for each mm -hmm. other uh, regardless of their marital or um, you know, sexual well, let, let's, orientation status? Let, let's, let's talk about the issues that are coming up mm -hmm. in one form or another in the state with respect to, to gay marriage or domestic partnerships. Um, I. Uh, would not support domestic partner benefits being extended to um, the partners of state employees. Uh, I, I think in a time of limited resources, I don't think that's something that we should be doing. Um, so th there's a good example of, of... But the UW is the only Big Ten school that doesn't mm -hmm. have domestic partner benefits. You think we should remain as the only one that doesn't have them? Well, I don't care what other states do. What I do believe is that, uh, especially at this time in our history, that's not something we can support and should support. On the other hand, though, there are many large companies who extend those domestic sure. partnership uh, mm -hmm. benefits to, to their employees. And I guess their reasoning is, number one, they feel it's the right thing to do, and number two, um, with health care costs, for example, mm -hmm. as they are, this is a way for families uh, to have health insurance benefits, so it's it's helping citizens and taxpayers, is it not? Well, but uh, first off, um, the latter part of your question, you're pointing something important. We need to do a better job of providing health care benefits for everybody mm -hmm. and, and access to health care. 
but, but, but secondly, those companies are not using taxpayer dollars. What we're talking mm -hmm. about here is the use of taxpayer dollars. In my view, is this is this is not something we should be using taxpayer dollars for. Mm -hmm. We ha we have so many challenges facing us right now with limited financial resources. Do you uh, believe? Oh, I'm a different topic. Mm -hmm. um, conceal carry. Support it. You support conceal carry. Mm -hmm. Why? Uh, because I believe it's a fundamental right. Um, secondly, when I take a look at the what roughly 40 states that have some version of concealed carry, all but you just said a second ago you don't care what other states do. But well. First, if I can finish what I was going to say, yeah. uh, the experience of other okay. states, every state that's gone to it has not switched back. So mm -hmm. that shows us that the experience of concealed carry is that it works. Don't you think, it, it, is there a level of crime in Wisconsin that calls for a concealed carry? What, what, well, again, what, what is the problem that concealed carry solves? Well, first off, concealed carry we believe is a right. So it's no matter of solving a problem, it is about a right that people should have. A. And secondly, um, I'm not willing to say that the level of crime we have in Wisconsin is acceptable. I'm just not. I mean, homicides right now in Milwaukee are in a record pace. I'm not going to say that. Do you think people should be able to conceal and carry anywhere? Like, I'm a university professor. Mm -hmm. it, it's the right of some of, say, one of my students to come to class. No, the conceal the concealed carry legislation that has come forward has appropriate safeguards, and I think that legislation would work. And, and obviously, concealed carry. You have to develop the rules to implement it as you do with almost any piece of legislation. I believe it's workable. Again, the experience in other states shows us that it's workable, that it has worked well. No state that has gone to concealed carry has switched back. Mm. Sure. Uh, photo IDs for voting is, is something that is uh, becoming a little bit more uh, in, the, in the news lately. Mm -hmm. More and more people are talking about it. There's movements that are in place to, to put things like vote, uh, photo ID uh, for voting in, in place. Um, you support that? Yeah. Uh, I've introduced a bill in the Washington, uh, um, an election reform bill that has a number of components to it. has a photo ID requirement for federal elections, not for state elections, for federal elections. It also addresses the legitimate concerns that um, a, a number of Democrats have raised, and that is that, that we call on our election volunteers and officials to do an awful lot. Mm -hmm. We should give them the resources and training they need to do their job well. I, my bill would do that as well. Uh, it would also go after some of the problems that we've seen in this last couple of elections, such things as um, um, uh, c convicted felon felons voting in some of the multiple voting. I worry quite a bit when we take a look at these last two elections, and now this last election in particular in Wisconsin, and everyone talks about Milwaukee County, but it's actually more than Milwaukee County, but also on the national level, people are beginning to have their faith shaken in elections. And that's a very, very dangerous thing. Now, you know, Tony, you're with the Green Party, and mm -hmm. I'm a Republican, but you and I have to have the faith that regardless of who wins, Democrat, Republican, Green mm -hmm. Party, Constitution mm -hmm. Party, that they have the mandate of the people, whether I right. particularly voted for them or not. And what I really worry about is that in these last couple of elections, in places like Wisconsin, Washington State, but, but there are others, that, that people are openly doubting right. the election results. And when you face the wide array of challenges that we do, and they're serious, in my view, we cannot afford to have that faith shaken. What kind of safeguards would you put in place then for um, People who are of a transient nature, mm -hmm. in particular, I'm thinking now of students, right. uh, where they move around a lot uh, by virtue of their student status and yet may be disenfranchised at the polls because of the way some of this uh, proposed legislation is being struck. Well, they wouldn't be disenfranchised. You still have walk-up, same-day registration. Now, there, there are populations that we do need to worry about. You support same-day registration? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, in the bill that we put together, um, we make exceptions for those who are institutionalized. Mm -hmm. We also, with the grant dollars that we have in the federal bill, we would provide grants to states like Wisconsin where they're making provision for low-income persons who, who you know, believe they can't afford to, to pay for an ID. I think all mm -hmm. those things we should address. I mean, those, w when people raise those concerns, I think those are concerns we should address. I mean, there's, you know, what's wrong with taking extra steps? And I mm -hmm. think we should do that. But it is so fundamentally important, I think, that we have the faith in, in, in the election system and that the person who okay. is going to vote is who he or she 
says he is. Mm -hmm. Do you believe that there should always be a paper ballot left behind somewhere? In other words, are you opposed to making this an electronic system where that leaves no paper ballot? That's where a lot of confidence will get shaken, yeah. as you know. Yeah, you know, I'm not sure. I, to be honest, I haven't really thought that one through. Because Mark Pocan has a bill right now he's putting hmm. forward that would mandate that we always have a paper That's ballot. That's an interesting idea. I mean, I, it, right. it's, it's something I'm willing to right. look at. Like I guess I really don't have uh, spend a lot of time. What is, what is your view on stem cell research for hmm. Wisconsin? The Republicans have been uh, criticized for taking a position on this that would, that would limit the amount of stem, rel, stem cell research we can do. What's well, your but, but understand they wouldn't limit the amount of research. They simply talk about um, the use of taxpayer dollars. There's a big difference. If Bill Gates wants to write a billion dollar check tomorrow for stem cell research, he can. Well, what it's is unrestricted. What is, what is your... My, my view yeah. is, is that um, um, there is so much promising research taking place in the area of stem cells that, um, particularly in adult stem cells, cord blood stem cells, mm -hmm. there are areas of stem cell research that are absolutely non-controversial. Right. Cord blood. And passed with, what, 400 plus votes in the House. Mm -hmm. That should be where we, f we put our taxpayer dollars because for millions of Americans, it is a matter of ethics and it is a matter of controversy, the use of taxpayer dollars to destroy human embryos. And so I believe, as we've done with the Hyde Amendment, the Hyde Amendment says the taxpayer dollars shall not be used to fund abortion. It was a reasonable compromise dealing with taxpayer dollars. But there's also a position we should talk about where Governor Doyle and I disagree in this area. Mm -hmm. Governor Doyle supports human embryonic cloning. I don't. I don't think that we should create life, really human life, for the purposes of exploiting it or destroying it. I think that's wrong. That's another area where we disagree on stem cell research. Well, that's also called therapeutic cloning. There is no He's not talking about cloning yeah, Mark no, Reed no, no, and no. Tony Palmieri. He sure is. No. Yes, he is. There is no difference in procedure between therapeutic and reproductive cloning. The difference is how long you allow the embryo to live. It's the only difference. Well, we could go a long time on that one, sure. <laughs> no, it's true. We're running out of time. No, but, here. It's, but it's an yeah, important no, point. point. If if the embryo is destroyed or exploded, exploited within a couple of days, they call it therapeutic. If the embryo lives a few days longer, it's reproductive. Just very quickly, we talk about you running against Jim Doyle, but you've got to get to a Republican primary. Mm -hmm. And why are you more qualified than than Scott Walker? Scott's a good friend of mine, and and we agree on on most things. Mm -hmm. The difference is a matter of profile. Um, I have worked with every part of Wisconsin's fabric of life, which is what I believe it will take to win in this state. I, I work with manufacturers, as we've talked about. I work with veterans. I brought a new veterans clinic to northeastern Wisconsin. I work with soldiers. I've been to Iraq twice, Afghanistan once. I work with farmers. I was one of the two or three people that, milk, or that wrote the milk program that saved thousands of dairy farmers in this state. I work with the community of faith. I'm the founder of the co-founder of the faith-based caucus in Washington and the lead author of the faith-based initiative, uh, codifying the presence faith-based initiative. So I, I have literally worked with, I think, every part of Wisconsin's fabric of life, the communities around this state. Mm -hmm. That's what I believe it will take to win the election, and I think that's what it will take to govern and govern well. Okay, okay very good. And with that, we're out of time, but thank you very, very much for being here. My pleasure. It, it's been a fun hour. Uh, Tony, thanks to you, and as always, thanks to you folks at home for letting us into your homes for the last hour. Uh, we hope to see you again soon. Until then, take good care, and we'll see you next time. Keep your eye on us. We've got our eye on Oshkosh.
Thank you.